section eight of beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations by john lord confucius part two confucius sometimes soared to the highest morality known to the pagan world chung kung asked about perfect virtue the master said it is when you go abroad to behave to everyone as if you were receiving a great guest to have no murmuring against you in the country and family and not to do to others as you would not wish done to yourself the superior man has neither anxiety nor fear let him never fail reverentially to order his own conduct and let him be respectful to others and observant of propriety then all within the four seas will be brothers hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principles and be moving continually to what is right fan chi asked about benevolence the master said it is to love all men another asked about friendship confucius replied faithfully admonish your friend and kindly try to lead him if you find him impracticable stop do not disgrace yourself this saying reminds us of that of our great master cast not your pearls before swine there is no greater folly than in making oneself disagreeable without any probability of reformation someone asked what do you say about the treatment of injuries the master answered recompense injury with justice and recompense kindness with kindness here again he was not far from the greater teacher on the mount when a man's knowledge is sufficient to attain and his virtue is not sufficient to hold whatever he may have gained he will lose again one of the favorite doctrines of confucius was the superiority of the ancients to the men of his day said he the high-mindedness of antiquity showed itself in a disregard of small things that of the present day shows itself in license the stern dignity of antiquity showed itself in grave reserve that of the present shows itself in quarrelsome perverseness the policy of antiquity showed itself in straightforwardness that of the present in deceit the following is a saying worthy of montaigne of all people girls and servants are the most difficult to behave to if you are familiar with them they lose their humility if you maintain reserve to them they are discontented such are some of the sayings of confucius on account of which he was regarded as the wisest of his countrymen and as his conduct was in harmony with his principles he was justly revered as a pattern of morality the greatest virtues which he enjoined were sincerity truthfulness and obedience to duty whatever may be the sacrifice to do right because it is right and not because it is expedient filial piety extending to absolute reverence and an equal reverence for rulers he had no theology he confounded god with heaven and earth he says nothing about divine providence he believed in nothing supernatural he thought little and said less about a future state of rewards and punishments his morality was elevated but not supernal we infer from his writings that his age was degenerate and corrupt but as we have already said his reproofs were gentle blandness of speech and manners was his distinguishing outward peculiarity and this seems to characterize his nation whether learned from him or whether an inborn national peculiarity i do not know he went through great trials most creditably but he was no martyr he constantly complained that his teachings fell on listless ears which made him sad and discouraged but he never flagged in his labors to improve his generation he had no egotism but great self-respect reminding us of michelangelo he was humble but full of dignity serene though distressed cheerful but not hilarious were he to live among us now we should call him a perfect gentleman with aristocratic sympathies but more autocratic in his views of government and society than aristocratic he seems to have loved the people and was kind even respectful to everybody when he visited a school it is said that he arose in quiet deference to speak to the children since some of the boys he thought would probably be distinguished and powerful at no distant day he was also remarkably charitable and put a greater value on virtues and abilities than upon riches and honors though courted by princes he would not serve them in violation of his self-respect asked no favors and returned their presence if he did not live above the world he adorned the world we cannot compare his teachings with those of christ they are immeasurably inferior in loftiness and spirituality 
but they are worldly wise and decorous and are on an equality with those of solomon in moral wisdom they are wonderfully adapted to a people who are conservative of their institutions and who have more respect for tradition than for progress the worship of ancestors is closely connected with veneration for parental authority and with absolute obedience to parents is allied absolute obedience to the emperor as head of the state hence the writings of confucius have tended to cement the chinese imperial power in which fact we may perhaps find the secret of his extraordinary posthumous influence no wonder that emperors and rulers have revered and honored his memory and used the power of the state to establish his doctrines moreover his exaltation of learning as a necessity for rulers has tended to put all the offices of the realm into the hands of scholars there was never a country where scholars have been and still are so generally employed by the government and as men of learning are conservative in their sympathies so they generally are fond of peace and detest war hence under the influence of scholars the policy of the chinese government has always been mild and pacific it is even paternal it has more similarity to the governments of a remote antiquity than that of any existing nation thus is the influence of confucius seen in the stability of government and of conservative institutions as well as in decency in the affairs of life and gentleness and courtesy of manners above all is his influence seen in the employment of men of learning and character in the affairs of state and in all the offices of government as the truest guardians of whatever tends to exalt a state and make it respectable and stable if not powerful for war or daring in deeds of violence confucius was essentially a statesman as well as a moralist but his political career was an apparent failure since few princes listened to his instructions yet if he was lost to his contemporaries he has been preserved by posterity perhaps there never lived a man so worshipped by posterity who had so slight a following by the men of his own time unless we liken him to that greatest of all prophets who being despised and rejected is and is to be the headstone of the corner in the rebuilding of humanity confucius says so little about the subjects that interested the people of china that some suppose he had no religion at all nor did he mention but once in his writings shang ti the supreme deity of his remote ancestors and he deduced nothing from the worship of him and yet there are expressions in his sayings which seem to show that he believed in a supreme power he often spoke of heaven and loved to walk in the heavenly way heaven to him was destiny by the power of which the world was created by heaven the virtuous are rewarded and the guilty are punished out of love for the people heaven appoints rulers to protect and instruct them prayer is unnecessary because heaven does not actively interfere with the soul of man confucius was philosophical and consistent in all pervading principle by which he insisted upon the common source of power in government of the state of the family and of oneself self-knowledge and self-control he maintained to be the fountain of all personal virtue and attainment in performance of the moral duties owed to others whether above or below in social standing he supposed all men are born equally good but that the temptations of the world at length destroy the original rectitude the superior man who next to the sage holds the highest place in the confucian humanity conquers the evil in the world though subject to infirmities his acts are guided by the laws of propriety and are marked by strict sincerity confucius admitted that he himself had failed to reach the level of the superior man this admission may have been the result of his extraordinary humility and modesty in the great learning confucius lays down the rules to enable one to become a superior man the foundation of his rules is in the investigation of things or knowledge with which virtue is indissolubly connected as in the ethics of socrates he maintained that no attainment can be made and no virtue can remain untainted without learning without this benevolence becomes folly sincerity recklessness straightforwardness rudeness and firmness foolishness but mere accumulation of the facts was not knowledge for learning without thought is labor lost and thought without learning is perilous complete wisdom was to be found only among the ancient sages by no mental endeavor could any man hope to equal the supreme wisdom of yao and of shun the object of learning he said should be the truth and the combination of learning with a firm will will surely lead a man to virtue virtue must be free from all hypocrisy and guile the next step towards perfection is the cultivation of the person 
which must begin with introspection and ends in harmonious outward expression every man must guard his thoughts words and actions and conduct must agree with words by words the superior man directs others but in order to do this his words must be sincere it by no means follows however that virtue is the invariable concomitant of plausible speech the height of virtue is filial piety for this is connected indissolubly with loyalty to the sovereign who is the father of his people and the preserver of the state loyalty to the sovereign is synonymous with duty and is outwardly shown by obedience next to parents all superiors should be the object of reverence this reverence it is true should be reciprocal a sovereign forfeits all right to reverence and obedience when he ceases to be a minister of good but then only the man who has developed virtues in himself is considered competent to rule a family or a state for the same virtues which enable a man to rule the one will enable him to rule the other no man can teach others who cannot teach his own family the greatest stress as we have seen is laid by confucius on filial piety which consists in obedience to authority in serving parents according to propriety that is with the deepest affection and the father of the state with loyalty but while it is incumbent on a son to obey the wishes of his parents it is also a part of his duty to remonstrate with them should they act contrary to the rules of propriety all remonstrances however must be made humbly should these remonstrances fail the son must mourn in silence the obduracy of the parents he carries the obligations of filial piety so far as to teach that a son should conceal the immorality of a father forgetting the distinction of right and wrong brotherly love is the sequel of filial piety happy says he is the union with wife and children it is like the music of lutes and harps the love which binds brother to brother is second only to that which is due from children to parents it consists in mutual friendship joyful harmony and dutiful obedience on the part of the younger to the elder brothers while obedience is exacted to an elder brother and to parents confucius said but little respecting the ties which should bind husband and wife he had but little respect for woman and was divorced from his wife after living with her for a year he looked on women as every way inferior to men and only to be endured as necessary evils it was not until a woman became a mother that she was treated with respect in china hence according to confucius the great object of marriage is to increase the family especially to give birth to sons women could be lawfully and properly divorced who had no children which put women completely in the power of men and reduced them to the condition of slaves the failure to recognize the sanctity of marriage is the great blot on the system of confucius as a scheme of morals but the sage exalts friendship everybody from the emperor downward must have friends and the best friends are those allied by ties of blood friends said he are wealth to the poor strength to the weak and medicine to the sick one of the strongest bonds to friendship is literature and literary exertion men are enjoined by confucius to make friends among the most virtuous of scholars even as they are enjoined to take service under the most worthy of great officers in the intercourse of friends the most unbounded sincerity and frankness is imperatively enjoined he who is not trusted by his friends will not gain the confidence of the sovereign and he who is not obedient to parents will not be trusted by friends everything is subordinated to the state but on the other hand the family friends culture virtue the good of the people is the main object of good government no virtue said emperor ku 2435 bc is higher than to love all men and there is no loftier aim in government than to profit all men when he was asked what should be done for the people he replied enrich them and when asked what more should be done he replied teach them on these two principles the whole philosophy of the sage rested the temporal welfare of the people and their education he laid great stress on knowledge as leading to virtue and on virtue as leading to prosperity he made the profession of a teacher the most honorable calling to which a citizen could aspire he himself was a teacher all sages are teachers though all teachers are not sages confucius enlarged upon the necessity of having good men in office the officials of his day excited his contempt and reciprocally scorned his teachings it was in contrast to these officials that he painted the ideal times of kings wan and Wu. the two motive powers of government according to confucius are righteousness and the observance of ceremonies righteousness is the law of the world as ceremonies form a rule to the heart 
what he meant by ceremonies was rules of propriety intended to keep all unruly passions in check and produce a reverential manner among all classes doubtless he overestimated the force of example since there are men in every country and community who will be lawless and reckless in spite of the best models of character and conduct the ruling desire of confucius was to make the whole empire peaceful and happy the welfare of the people the right government of the state and the prosperity of the empire were the main objects of his solicitude as conducive to these he touched on many other things incidentally such as the encouragement of music of which he was very fond he himself summed up the outcome of his rules for conduct in this prohibitive form do not unto others that which you would not have them do to you here we have the negative side of the positive golden rule reciprocity and that alone was his law of life he does not inculcate forgiveness of inquiries but exacts a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye as to his own personal character it was nearly faultless his humility and patience were alike remarkable and his sincerity and candor were as marked as his humility he was the most learned man in the empire yet lamented the deficiency of his knowledge he even disclaimed the qualities of the superior man much more those of the sage i am said he not virtuous enough to be free from cares nor wise enough to be free from anxieties nor bold enough to be free from fear he was always ready to serve his sovereign or the state but he neither grasped office nor put forward his own merits nor sought to advance his own interests he was grave generous tolerant and sincere he carried into practice all the rules he taught poverty was his lot in life but he never repined at the absence of wealth nor lost the severe dignity which is ever to be associated with wisdom and the force of personal character indeed his greatness was in his character rather than in his genius and yet i think his genius has been underrated his greatness is seen in the profound devotion of his followers to him however lofty their merits or exalted their rank no one ever disputed his influence and fame and his moral excellence shines all the brighter in view of the troublous times in which he lived when warriors occupied the stage and men of letters were driven behind the scenes the literary labors of confucius were very great since he made the whole classical literature of china accessible to his countrymen the fame of all preceding writers is merged in his own renown his works have had the highest authority for more than two thousand years they have been regarded as the exponents of supreme wisdom and adopted as text-books by all scholars and in all schools in that vast empire which includes one-fourth of the human race to all educated men the book of changes yin king the book of poetry shi king the book of history shu king the book of rights li king the great learning ta heo showing the parental essence of all government and the doctrine of the mean chung yung teaching the golden mean of conduct and the confucian analects lun yu recording his conversations are supreme authorities to which must be added the works of Mencius, the greatest of his disciples. There is no record of any books that have exacted such supreme reverence in any nation as the works of Confucius, except the Quran of the Mohammedans, the Book of Law among the Hebrews, and the Bible among the Christians. What an influence for one man to have exerted on subsequent ages, who laid no claim to divinity or even originality, recognized as a man, worshipped as a god. No sooner had the son of Confucius set under a cloud, since sovereigns and princes had neglected if they had not scorned his precepts then his memory and principles were duly honored but it was not until the accession of the han dynasty 206 b c that the reigning emperor collected the scattered writings of the sage and exerted his vast power to secure the study of them throughout the schools of china it must be borne in mind that a hostile emperor of the preceding dynasty had ordered the books of confucius to be burned but they were secreted by his faithful admirers in the walls of houses and beneath the ground succeeding emperors heaped additional honors on the memory of the sage and in the early part of the sixteenth century an emperor of the ming dynasty gave him the title which he at present bears in china the perfect sage the ancient teacher confucius no higher title could be conferred upon him in a land where to be ancient is to be revered for more than twelve hundred years temples have been erected in his honor and his worship has been universal throughout the empire his maxims of morality have appealed to human consciousness in every succeeding generation and carry as much weight today as they did when the han dynasty made them the standard of human wisdom 
they were especially adapted to the chinese intellect which although shrewd and ingenious is phlegmatic unspeculative matter-of-fact and unspiritual moreover as we have said it was to the interest of rulers to support his doctrines from the constant exhortations to loyalty which confucius enjoined and yet there is in his precepts a democratic influence also since he recognized no other titles or ranks but such as are won by personal merit thus opening every office in the state to the learned whatever their original social rank the great political truth that the welfare of the people is the first duty and highest aim of rulers has endeared the memory of the sage to the unnumbered millions who toil upon the scantiest means of subsistence that have been known in any nation's history this essay on the religion of the chinese would be incomplete without some allusion to one of the contemporaries of confucius who spiritually and intellectually was probably his superior and to whom even confucius paid extraordinary deference this man was called lao Tse, a recluse and philosopher who was already an old man when confucius began his travels he was the founder of tao Tse, a kind of rationalism which at present has millions of adherents in china this old philosopher did not receive confucius very graciously since the younger man declared nothing new only wishing to revive the teachings of ancient sages while he himself was a great awakener of thought he was like confucius a politico-ethical teacher but unlike him sought to lead people back to a state of primitive society before forms and regulations existed he held that man's nature was good and that primitive pleasures and virtues were better than worldly wisdom he maintained that spiritual weapons cannot be formed by laws and regulations and that prohibiting enactments tended to increase the evils they were meant to avert while this great and profound man was in some respects superior to confucius his influence has been most seen on the inferior people of china taoism rivals buddhism as a religion of the lower classes and taoism combined with buddhism has more adherents than confucianism but the wise the mighty and the noble still cling to confucius as the greatest man whom china has produced of spiritual religion indeed the lower millions of chinese have now but little conception their nearest approach to any supernaturalism is the worship of deceased ancestors and their religious observances are the grossest formalism but as a practical system of morals in the days of its earliest establishment the religion of confucius ranks very high among the best developments of paganism Certainly no man ever had a deeper knowledge of his countrymen than he, or adapted his doctrines to the peculiar needs of their social organism with such amazing tact. It is a remarkable thing that all the religions of antiquity have practically passed away with their cities and empires, except among the Hindus and Chinese, and it is doubtful if these religions can withstand the changes which foreign conquest and Christian missionary enterprise and civilization are producing in the east the old religions gave place to mohammedanism as in the west they disappeared before the power of christianity and these conquering religions retain and extend their hold upon the human mind and human affections by reason of their fundamental principles the fatherhood of a personal god and the brotherhood of universal man with the ideas prevalent among all sects that god is not only supreme in power but benevolent in his providence and that every man has claims and rights which cannot be set aside by kings or rulers or priests nations must indefinitely advance in virtue and happiness as they receive and live by the inspiration of this elevating faith authorities religion in china by joseph edkins d d rawlinson's religions of the ancient world Freeman Clark's Ten Great Religions, Johnson's Oriental Religions, Davis's Chinese, Nevin's China and the Chinese, Giles's Chinese Sketches, Lenormand's Ancient History of the East, Hughes' Christianity in China, Legge's Prologamena to the Shu King, Lecomte's China, Dr. S. Wells Williams's Middle Kingdom, China by Professor Douglas, The Religions of China by James Legge. End of section eight.